Mind Vacation Bible School coming up. Again, that will be here before you know it. That's the 17th through the 21st. That is a Sunday night. We start Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. Uh, we are going to try to do meals for the workers again, but that will just be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And again, as I shared with the early group, if uh, you can help with that, uh, Brother Bill's not going to be able to that this year, and I am going to um, do that so I can use a couple of helpers if you can help with that, let me know. Um, also, just look at the schedule for next month. Work day is on the 23rd, and family day, I'm sorry, yeah, family day is the 24th. And by the way, thank, thanks again for those of you who came to help yesterday. Um, we brought our tools of mass destruction and tore down all the offices. No choir practice until August the 3rd, so keep that in mind. All right, I think that that is all I need to tell you. So, yes. I just want to just say something real quick. I want you to thank everybody who came through, all of your kindness. Um, we were able to get our air conditioning fixed this week. Oh, praise, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise praise the Lord. Praise 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 the Lord. Praise 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 so everybody knows where you can go now. Yeah. 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 So thank you. <laughs> They're kind of flop.
great vacation, but it's good to be back. All right, it is now pending March time, so seek a place of safety. Turn to 180. Reminds me of a little kid that fell asleep years ago in a church we were members of, and uh, we were attending church. And she, the little child, woke up right in the middle of, uh, uh, right in the middle of the pastor's message, and she turned around just out pretty loud. She says, "Where's Jesus?" And then she looked up there and says, "There he is." <laughs> so I'm not sure, Pastor. Maybe that's what, what the same kind of a syndrome, I guess. You know. Well, we're glad that you're here this morning. May the Lord bless you for having come and met with us this morning. And uh, it's been a warm week, hasn't it? And we're so glad that uh, we're sitting here in a nice, cool environment this morning, being able to fellowship with one another and uh, enjoy the uh, services this morning. Take a quick look, if you will, please, at your offering report. We had a good offering last week. We want to thank the Lord for that. We do want to encourage you to remember, if you want to help out on the uh, project, the restroom project uh, in the barn building, uh, please make sure you do mark that as such so that it will get appropriately applied to the appropriate account. We're at 25651.02. Uh, so we've got a little ways to go. And uh, my understanding is we want to try to pay for that as we go. So uh, uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, I'm just trusting the Lord, that, uh, and I'm sure you are too, that uh, that'll happen. Uh, God, only God can make these kinds of things realities, you know that, and so we just need to trust Him and so forth. All right, don't forget uh, to uh, be planning on Vacation Bible School. Pastor has been talking about that, and uh, we're looking forward to that this year. It's a highlight of our uh, of our year here at uh, Victory. The Blackwells are our missionaries for this week and pray for them as well as for all of our missionaries and the Lord will bless them. And if you haven't uh, made missions an aspect of your stewardship, I'd encourage you to do so. We do have quite a missionary load that we try to help and uh, everybody's help is certainly appreciated and in fact is uh, needed. <laughs> so I encourage you to have a part in that. Our stewardship verse this morning comes from Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, this is, a, this is the summertime season, and uh, uh, because it's the summertime season, there are some things that you are mindful of. You know, you got insects and things like that, but you also got uh, the sun. And uh, exposing ourselves to the sun eventually is going to leave an impression on our skin. We call that what? Sunburn. We call that sunburn. I'm surprised that we didn't see some of that on some of these folks that come back from Florida. But evidently, they uh, probably uh, spent under the time under a blank or under a umbrella, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, that's a, that's a characteristic of being in the sun. I'm kind of an amateur photographer. I like to take photographs. I used to buy old box cameras and different type of old cameras and take pictures with them if I could find the film that would go into them because I thought they delivered a picture that was kind of unique and it had a kind of a rustic look to them. And I still have a lot of those old pictures that I took back then. That was before there was uh, pixels, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, then the, and it was just a 
just a photographic uh, uh, film that you put in the camera, and it had a plate and so forth, and that's how it worked. And uh, the sunlight would fall on that sensitive plate and, and re, uh, give an image. The longer the exposure, uh, the deeper the imprint. And an overexposed photo is what they would call a washout. Uh, similar to a sunburn, I guess, on, in, in, in photography. Everything we do, when you think about it, everything that we watch, everything that we read, leaves an imprint on our soul, is, which is similar to that sensitive photo plate. We should choose carefully what we expose ourselves to. If we bombard ourselves with undesirable television programs, publications, or music that promotes violence and obscenity, it's going to leave a deep impression on our souls. And the imprint will eventually twist our norms and our standards and rendering us unable to normally re uh, interact and relate to people in personal relationships. And before long, we become socially unacceptable. We become washed out. God wants us to expose ourselves to his word and to do so as often as possible. When we constantly think about biblical truths, the image of virtue and integrity and grace, we will be, it'll, it's going to be imprinted deeply upon our souls. It will bear a striking resemblance of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the physical manifestation of God himself. The result, of course, then is what? It's inner happiness. It's uh, confidence, it's a non-judgmental attitude, it's a relaxed mental attitude it, regarding all the circumstances that we have and encounter in life. So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's a stewardship verse. We are stewards of our souls. The, Jesus Christ is the great shepherd, and he's entrusted us to be the appropriate steward of what kind of an image we cast upon our souls. And the right kind of image is going to produce the right kind of results. And so I would encourage you this morning, and I encourage myself, along with all of you, uh, to make sure the things that we're imprinting upon our soul are the things that God would be pleased with and that will return a spiritual investment uh, that will result in a happy and, and appropriate kind of lifestyle. So may the Lord bless you this morning. We're going to have our offering received at this time. So if the mid come at this time, and uh, we encourage you this morning to have a part. If not, we're going to pray for you so that maybe at some time future you will have an opportunity and be blessed in such a way that you too can participate. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you today. We are so thankful for your grace that you have manifest in our hearts and our lives. And we pray, Father, that indeed we might live such a life that is glorifying to you. And Lord, that we will indeed be stewards of our souls. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
one of the most respected gospel songwriters during the mid-century of the 1900s was a, uh, a lady by the name of Mary John Wilk, and, and she wrote a number of uh, gospel songs. If I were to list them, you would probably undoubtedly recognize a number of them, and this is one of hers, Mary John Wilk, and written about somewhere in the 1970s, I think, and it's uh, titled His Kind of Love. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father, said the Son. So he completed her earthly task he had begun. He let this old world have its way for one dark and tragic day. To bring us love, perfect love, his kind of love. I can almost feel the heaven shuddering still. Standing helpless, watching Jesus climb the hill. Asking help from not one man. It was the nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was his love for us that made him pay the cost. And how the angels must have cried, watching helpless as he died to bring us love, perfect love. His kind of love. It is finished. Those were the last words spoken. From the body of a man whose heart was broken. God condemned by man the judge, accepting judgment without one grudge. To bring us love, perfect love, his kind of love. It was the nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was his love for us that made him pay the cost. And how the angels must have cried watching helpless as he died to bring us love perfect love his kind of love to bring us love perfect love his kind of preach in front of y'all. Um, turn with me in the book of Philippians. Um, when I get back to uh, my service, I'm going to uh, do a series um, after much prayer and consideration. I think we're going to go into the book of James, so that will start, I believe, two weeks from today. 
Uh, but today we're going to, this is a uh, message for me because one of my fav most favorite books of the Bible or one that I really enjoy that I read over and over again is the book of Philippians. And the passage that we're going to look at this morning is one that I have gone to time and time again. And we find in Philippians chapter 3, we're going to be looking at two verses this morning. We're going to be looking at 12 through 14. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12, says, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me for a word of prayer? Lord, we come to you this morning. Father, we ask if but just for a moment you would quiet our hearts. Father, that you would quiet our minds, that we would be able to, if just for a little bit, put off the distraction of the world. Put off the things that are going on around us. Uh, put off the things that are, uh, are to come later today or this week. But Father, help us just focus in on your word. That we would allow your word to wash over us, Father. That it wouldn't be about my opinion. It wouldn't be about what I have to say. But just simply that your word is enough. And you have given us the perfect instruction of what we need. We pray, Father, for those that have come here this morning, Father, that just by their action, they have shown that they want to put you first, that they want to hear your word, that they want to be in fellowship, Father. And we pray, God, that you would just take over our services now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we all know that whether you're actively struggling or not, none of us are perfect. If we were to go, we could all agree that we are not a perfect people. That is what Paul is saying here, that he's not perfect. See, there are, there are many that are out there today that even would preach this, uh, this, uh, this rogue form of the gospel that we somehow achieve perfection. And that, um, but Paul is saying here that even after all of the things that he's done and all the accomplishments that he has had, he's telling them that I am not perfect. But he's increasingly trying every day to be more and more like Christ. That, that is what the real Christian faith is about. That's what the real uh, Christian life is about, is the fact that we are not a perfect people. In fact, I can't, I can't get through a single day. In fact, some days, there, I struggle to get through a single hour. And if we were to be real honest, there's some days even further that I struggle to get through a single minute before you would realize that I am not perfect. And what Paul is telling to the church in Philippi is he's telling them, I am not perfect. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. He's saying I'm not perfect. And he had just talked about trying to obtain the, uh, achieve the uh, righteousness and righteous living. But we all struggle. None of us are perfect. All of us have to face the harsh reality that we struggle. And unfortunately, during life, we will always struggle. I would like for it to be true for me to tell you this morning that if you just believe in yourself enough, then one day the, the, uh, that all of your best days are ahead of you. I would want it to be true to tell you that if you just believe in yourself enough that it, this is kind of like a, a, a fairy tale or a movie that it all works out in the end. But it would be a lie. But I can tell you with the utmost confidence that even though it's not in this world, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then your best days are ahead. And it's not based on your attitude about it or you just 
focusing on, on winning in this life. But it's about what He has done to win us in eternity. We'll always, some of us will always struggle. And there's certain things that we'll struggle with. Christians struggle and non-Christians alike. We all struggle. We face the questions of life. But the difference is, what is the answer to those questions? Well, for non-Christians, the answer to the question is sometimes simply distraction. We try to distract, the world is supposed to try to distract themselves from eternal things. Why do you think atheism is such a popular thing? Is it because it's provable, because it makes sense? No, it's because it's a distraction of what God has to say about life and what God has to say about the afterlife. So then we try to distract ourselves with the pleasures of the world. And after all, I know that we get upset and I know that we get mad. But if we really were to think about it, if you truly believe that this is it, why would you limit yourself? That's, that's, the, that's the appeal to the world when it comes to atheism and all of that. It's, it's not because they, they can make sense of it, but it's because it eliminates God. And when you eliminate God, it eliminates your accountability to Him. We all struggle. And for the non-believer, the answer to that is distraction. And some, it's even destruction. They try to fill themselves with, with, uh, with things, with chemicals, with whatever it takes to be able to quiet that voice that is continuously telling them there is a God, you're accountable to Him. But for the Christian... Pressing on, not because of who we are, but because of who we belong to. Pressing on even when we don't have the strength within ourselves to press any further. It's pressing on even when we don't know the out, what the outcome will be. That's what faith is. It's staying faithful to God's word even when we don't have a clear cut path of where we're going. In fact, when God called Abraham to go, to go, he tells him, go to a place that I prepared for you. And, and, and the terminology, it's hard, to, it, it's hard for us to translate it into the English language. But if the terminology that is in that Hebrew is that Abraham went while the command of the Lord was still ringing in his ear. There was no clear cut path. He didn't know where he was supposed to go. But he knew that God had called him to go. We press on even when we don't know what the outcome will be. We press on even when we don't understand what lies before us. Now, I want you to know that all of this stuff that we're talking about this morning is way easier said than done. Because it's easy to set back and to say, well, we've just got to keep faith and we've just got to press forward. We've just got to keep faith and we've just got to know that everything's going to be all right and that we're going to, in the long run, we're going to have all the answers. But we ain't going to have all the answers. It's easy to say that you just press forward tragedy until you're the one that's in the midst of the tragedy. So what do we ask? What do we say? What do you say to someone that is right in the midst of a tragedy? Do you tell them, though, I've got the answers, be more like me, this is what I would do in that situation, or do you tell them that God is still good and He's still God in the midst of tragedy and that I don't have all the answers? I am so grateful for your sakes this morning and for my own, that I don't have all the answers. I am grateful that we serve a God that is bigger than me. I'm thankful that we serve a God that does not need my permission or does not need for me to rationalize why He does what He does. We serve a big God. We serve a good God. 
We serve a God that even when we don't know what the outcome will be, we can press forward because he loves you and he knows what the outcome is. We can press forward because even though we don't understand what's before us, we serve a good God that understands. And we get beat down. We get is sometimes in, in, in certain stages of life, it seems like it's one thing right after another. What's the saying? When it rains, it pours. So what has been some of our answers to that? Well, we need more motivation. We may need more motivational speakers. Have any of you, if you've ever been in any type of sales environment, you'll go to these, uh, they'll put together these little conferences and things like of that sort, and those are designed to motivate the staff, motivate the people. And it works for a little while. Because you'll go into there, and, and for those of you that have not been able to experience this, and I'm not saying that it's, that it's all bad and that it, that it doesn't work at all, but you've got to keep into perspective because you'll go in there, you'll sit in a, a, a room full of your peers, and they'll have somebody that's a good communicator that will come up and, and, and be able to uh, work out all of these things and tell you this is how you should react and this and this and this. But then the time comes when difficulty, again, is at your door. Any of y'all that have ever worked with uh, the public, oh, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? <laughs> but they'll tell you, well, this is how you handle somebody that's disgruntled. This is how you handle somebody that's, that's mad. But there comes a time that that does not work. What happens to the motivational speaking? It can only take you so far. You have to realize the goal and put into perspective this life in light of eternity. See, we could, you, we could bring in here and try to motivate you and, and have you leave this place and you're saying, well, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to take on the world. But the problem is life is still out there and life is still happening. So we can make you feel good for a couple of hours. But then guess what? Tomorrow's still Monday. Some of y'all are going to go out and you're still going to deal with difficult people. You're going to wake up tomorrow and the bills are still due. You're going to wake up tomorrow and gas prices are still high. What do we tell people? Well, you just got to have more faith. You've just got to believe and achieve to win. Or do we tell them, this is only temporary. This is not all we got. This is not the last chapter. And I would go as far to tell you that if you live every single day for the rest of your life in nothing but, uh, in nothing but tragedy, if you're a believer in Christ, you still win. See, that's, that's where we've gotten off of these things, and that's what Paul can keep into perspective. Paul, everywhere he went, they were beating him. They were throwing him in prison. They would love him and then they would hate him. But yet he's saying, I press on. It's because we've put so much focus on this little life. This little bitty speck in our time. But if we put into perspective this life in light of eternity... And, I, and it's, it's hard for our minds to comprehend, I understand. But I, and I'm, I'm not going to speak for you, but I can speak for myself that when I step into eternity, I think I'm going to be baffled at the things that I thought most important. I'm going to be baffled and, and, and maybe even say embarrassed with how much in time I invested in whatever it may be. I'm going to be baffled by the things that kept me up at night or the things that stressed me out. 
in light of eternity. But Paul says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on. The Greek word was used here would be, uh, would be to describe a sprinter. It refers to an aggressive, energetic action. Paul pursued sanctification with all his might. Friends, if we don't get anything else from today, we need to learn this from Paul's writings under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because there's too many of us, me included, that we're just strolling through life, laxy daisy, waiting for Jesus to come back. Paul was waiting for Jesus to come back. But his terminology is not get inside uh, four walls with people that you all agree with, that you never, that you never have a disagreement, that we can all uh, be together and never go out and never venture out. But no, Paul was saying, I believe that Christ is coming, so I'm going to pursue sanctification with all my might. I'm going to strain in every spiritual muscle to win the prize. See, Paul understood that it was more than just motivation. Paul didn't need somebody to follow him around saying, you're doing a good thing, you're doing a good thing, you're doing a good thing. Does that only go so far when somebody's beating you with rocks or sticks? And I'm not saying when we words of encouragement, I'm not putting that down. We can give words of encouragement and we should give words of encouragement. But there better be something more. When the bottom falls out, when we are left with no explanation as to why things are so bad, there better be more than motivational, you're doing a good thing, you're doing a good thing. Some of my favorite movies are the Rocky movies. The first one's really, really good. But if, who said that? Worst one? All right. He's our sound guy, so I can't have him cut us off. So otherwise, we have a deacon to escort him out. But if you watch it, you'll find out that, you, uh, that Apollo Creed, he's the heavyweight champion of the world, and he's going to give somebody, he's going to give them the opportunity to come in and make a name for himself. But you'll notice that when he's getting ready as he's going, and everybody's telling him, man, you're the champ. You'll see this a lot. This is, this is a reality when it comes to these trainers that are on the payroll of these fighters. They tell them, there's nobody that's better than you. Nobody can hit as hard as you. Nobody has the endurance and the training and the things that you have. And there, there comes a scene that they're, uh, they're sitting around and they're trying to handle their business and they're talking about it. And he's over at the table trying to plan something out. And his trainer's sitting there watching the TV. And it's just, uh, it's just an interview and Rocky's in there and he's, and he's punching the slabs of meat and all of this stuff, if you've seen it. But he goes and this trainer, he tries to get Apollo's uh, uh, attention. And he's like, hey, you might want to come look at this. And no, because he, he, he's been, everybody's been telling him, you're the champ. You're the best. He's a nobody. And even up to the point till they get into their fight, they're saying, you're the champ. You're the best. He's a nobody. You're the best. And I know that it's just a movie and I know that it's not real. But there's, there's something we could take from it is because even in real, if you ever watch combat sports, they're telling them, you're the best. But then there's something that happens. You get in there, and this guy hits you in the face. And it hurts, even when you're the best. So... I say all that to say this, you're going to 
go, if you take anything out, I'm not the most quotable pa- pastor, but if you go out, some of you this week, you're going to be punched in the face by life. It's going to happen. And you can go and you can find YouTube videos of all these guys that will tell you what you need to do to not get punched in the face by life. But the reality of it is, is it's just motivational words that make us feel good in the moment because they want your money. And they can sit there beside you and say, you're the best, you're the champ, they're nobodies, you're the best, you're the best, you're the best. But then when you get punched in the face, what do we lean on? You have to keep the prize in mind so that you will still know that it's worth it even when you don't feel like it's worth it. 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. It's not time to slack off. It's not time to give up. It's not time to kind of put it in cruise control and and just kind of uh, safely carry this thing out. You say, well, yeah, things are getting crazy and I, I feel like we're on the brink of, uh, of, of Christ taking the church out of there. Well, that's not time to coast. That's time to run harder. That's time to run faster. That's time to uh, press on, to literally give everything we have left. 1 Timothy 6.12 also says, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Keep that in front of mind. We could try to cheapen the promises of God and tell you that uh, he wants you to have all the wealth. He wants you to always be healthy. And he wants you to have all these good things. And God does bless us. But what happens is all of these people that have attached the promises to God that he ever, never made, then people start to deal with life. It hits them in the face. It hits them financially. It hits them physically. And they can't reconcile. Because somebody promised them something that God never promised. Because somebody promised them that, well, God's a good God, which means he'll always do good things and you'll always have good things forever. God is a good God. God does good things. But we live in a fallen world. A fallen world riddled in sin. A fallen world in which we try to justify the murder of babies. And then we get mad when they make it harder for us to do it. That's the fallen world that we live in. Paul understood that Christians are not meant to live the relaxed lifestyle. It's not. I'm not saying that you can't have good things. I'm not saying that you can't kick back every once in a while. I'm not saying that you can't Uh, that you can't enjoy life. I'm not saying that at all. I believe that God has established things. God wants us to enjoy certain things, but it cannot be the focus. As a believer, we have to deal with all the same hardships of this life that the non-believer does. But we have to deal with these hardships also with the knowledge of, of the eternity that is to come. The truth that we have is not always a comfortable thing. So there's a lot of times we try to distract ourselves from it. I'll I'll give you an example. If you weren't thinking of it, when you're thinking of it and you're staying awake tonight, then you can thank me. (laughs) Every single person we encounter is either going to heaven or hell. Every single one. Every person you've ever talked to, every person that's ever died, they're in one of two places at this very moment. That's not a comfortable thing to know. And we have to deal with the hardships 
of the knowledge of eternity that is to come, that all of these people that we encounter, all of our loved ones, all of our friends, no matter their race, no matter their sex, no matter their, no, no matter their financial status or their stability, they are all going to come to a point that they, were, they will be before a holy God and they will give an account. You, me, everybody. It's not time to relax. It's not time to set back. It's not time to distract ourselves from the reality of what is to come. That's what the unbeliever does. And the reality is, we all have a past. I have a past, you have a past, Paul had a past. And if we know the background of Paul and what he came through, we'll, we'll, we'll see the power in these words. We all struggle with the past. And your past, it can haunt you. And in fact, the past, it can cripple you. The enemy that we fight against, the enemy of Satan and his demons, they love the past. They love to bring up the past. Especially when you try to witness to somebody or you're trying to uh, get right with God and you're trying to do better. They like to bring up the past. And they like to beat you over the head with it. And there are some people that won't allow you to forget your past. Oftentimes when you become a believer, those that you know and that are still in the world, they will not allow you to forget about the past. They use phrases like, you will always be or you will never be. Who are you to witness to me? How, how have you, all of a sudden, and they like to use the phrase, gotten religion? Don't you know that Paul had to probably deal with that stuff all the time? When he would call out sin, you, could, you, could, you would know that they say, Are you kidding me? You killed people. You threw people into prison. You were going after the church, and now you want to call for me to repent? Who are you? Well, you know what Paul says about that? But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. You have to let it go. You have to forgive yourself and realize that Christ fulfills his promise when he promised to remember them no more. So no matter who it is that tells you, you always are going to be this, and don't you remember that you were that, it's not about me. You know what? In fact, those that try to remind you of your past, don't, don't shy away from it. Don't hide it under the rug, saying, you know what? Bless God, that's true, but He has made me a new creation. You are absolutely right. That's who I used to be, but that's why I needed a Savior. You can remember the past and the lessons that you learned, but you cannot live there. We have to change our focus. And if we were to change our focus, so if you're in here this morning and you're going to change your focus and you're focusing on the past and you, uh, you, you continue to beat yourself up and dwell on what used to be, we're called to change our focus. And Paul does that. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Don't allow the world to define you, but rather allow Christ to define you. Doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they think about you. It doesn't matter what they have to say about your past. It's what he says that matters. And what does he offer? That's what matters. And he offers truth. And what does his truth offer? His truth offers freedom. John 8, 32, and you will know the truth, 
and the truth will set you free. What is the truth? Is the truth what everybody else says about you, or is the truth what God knows about you? The truth is you were created for a purpose, and that purpose is to worship and bring glory to your Creator. Your, your purpose is not to make sure that you live the best life here on earth. That's not your purpose. Your purpose is to worship and bring glory to your Creator. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. For the believer, it's not... in us to just give up. Some days I want to. I want to just give up. When you're weak and you're trying to, do you, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but there's some, there's some days I'm just like, I, I, I don't think I can go on anymore. How much worse can it get? So when you're in that place, where do you find strength? Do we need more motivational speeches to make us feel good, to distract us? Or do we need to draw upon the strength of God? Do we need to draw upon the encouragement of God? Do we need to draw under the fact that even if I walk out of here this morning and tragedy strikes me, That it's still all right. Because guess what happens when I die? I get to go be with him. Guess what happens if they continue to increase prices and they persecute Christians and they kill us all? You guess what? We get to go be with him. So fight the good fight, run the race. Have everybody bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, you know the hearts of each and every individual in here this morning. Father, you know that when we get discouraged and you know when we uh, just feel like we can't go on, Father. And just as I said earlier, I know that these are easier said than to put to practice, Father. And Father, we don't just need your help to put these uh, these priorities to practice. But Father, we need you to do a work within us. And we are asking, Father. Father, you say in your word that if we lack wisdom, that we are to ask you. And Father, I, I lack wisdom in a lot of areas. Father, I lack wisdom into how to witness to those around me. I lack wisdom as to how to rightly parent my children in this current culture. I lack wisdom into how to love my wife in the current culture. I lack wisdom, Father, in how to love my brothers and sisters and how to serve you better. Father, we need your wisdom. Show us what you'd have us do. Father, I want you to thank you for each and every person that has come here this morning, Father. There's no way that I can know all the struggles and all the things that are going on in their life. But Father, you know. And better you to know than me because you have the ability to be able to do something about it. We put our trust in you. We love you. And Father, no matter what life throws at us, no matter if we look pitiful to the world, Father, we know that this ain't it. Help us to live like it. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. At this time, I'll turn it back over to Pastor.